in the actions palette here you have two actions for video. We can click here on the submenu and say load our video actions and they'll come up. Notice I've actually loaded it twice there so I'll get rid of one. And the first one says alpha channel from visible layers. Okay, make this a little bigger here. The second one says alpha channel from visible layers inverted. That's for people working on avid type editing programs because that requires an inverted alpha. We can select this and press play and what it does is it says it's going to make an alpha channel. Please turn off anything you don't want in the final graphic. And then you click continue. And you may not have seen it happen, but what it did is, is it went through and did about 10 steps and made the alpha channel. If you want to see what the action did, you could twirl it down. Now, that's pretty straightforward and we just used it, okay? Same thing here. Let's open up something a little more complex and we follow the same mentality. It says turn off anything that doesn't belong in the final graphic. Run the action. And if I come over here to the channels palette and look, you'll see that it created a proper alpha channel with the ramp transparency, all the glows, everything recognized. So if you bring this into a video tool and this graphic will key in real time. File, save as, and you simply save that out as a picked TIFF or Targa. I usually choose TIFF and check the box with alpha channels and layers and save it. Okay, here's a little gotcha. Do not check this box that says save with transparency. Don't. There's a bug in the TIFF format. If you have an alpha channel and you check the box that says save with transparency, it's like a double negative and the two cancel each other out and you have no transparency. And everybody I ask to fix it just looks at me and they don't understand the problem. And literally one person said to me, well, if you know it doesn't work, why do you check it? I said, well, I know that, but you don't know how many people tell me that they save their files with transparency and then it doesn't work. So don't touch this box, okay? And you save it, and it writes it out. And if we bring that into a video editing tool, it will key in real time over a video source, okay? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, there's other things, though, we can do with these actions, okay? For example, um, this is just a sample file that has lots of things wrong with it, so that's what I'm going to use it for. And let me just open this up. And this image has just about everything wrong with it for terms of video because it's got really fine details, it's got really bright spots, it's got all sorts of things. One of the things that I guarantee is a problem in this image, let's turn this off, is the amount of detail in it, okay? Have any of you ever put images on a video screen and you've had them flicker or shimmer? Okay, things hit TV. What's happening there is video is usually interlaced, and that means that half of the image loads, and then the other half loads. And so if you have lines or details that are thinner than three pixels, they literally appear and disappear, appear and disappear, and that's what causes them to flicker when they hit a screen. So if you take advantage here, basically, you could do this all by hand, and what I'm about to do is something like this. Duplicate the image, shift it up one pixel, set this to difference mode, you don't have to memorize any of this. That, see all those white areas? That's all the areas that are thinner than one pixel. So then it selects it, it copies it, and it uh, basically does a copy merge, and it pastes it, and it strips away the color, and it brings up this, and it loads it as a selection, and it feathers it, and that's a lot of work which is why you have an action called interlace flicker removal. That if you look at this action, you see it does that many things. And that's what actions do. They play back multiple steps. So, go. And what it basically just did is, is it created a selection on all the thin areas and applied a straight up and down blur and spread the pixels out vertically so they would cover more scan lines. It doesn't defocus the entire picture, it just takes the really thin areas and spreads the pixels a little bit so they flicker less on a television. And if you need to, you might run that two or three times. 
Now you're saying, how do I know how many times to run it? Plug in a FireWire device like a DEC or an analog to digital video converter or a camera into Photoshop via the FireWire port, and you could choose File Export Video Preview. And you could send out over your FireWire port a video preview to a television monitor. That's been there since CS2. Okay? So it works, and if you don't have a digital, it does go down to digital video. If you want to go above the DV codec, then you need a third-party tool called EchoFire that will work with high-end Avid broadcast cards and things like that, and it'll let you recognize more devices. Okay? Um, if you have other problems here, uh, for example, like really bright spots, there are a couple of actions here, and these I have to be a little bit cautious with. There's two types of issues with broadcast safe. There's luminance and there's saturation. Depending upon your nonlinear editor, you may need to adjust. Some editing tools want you to bring graphics in between the RGB values of 16 and 235, and they call that 601 levels. Some tools like Final Cut, Premiere, automatically adjust the other ones for you when you bring them in too hot. So you sort of have to look at your individual nonlinear editor. Basically, if you bring in a graphic and you put it on a broadcast scope and the whites go above 100, then you need to do this to your graphics. So if you're working in an analog environment or you're working in an Avid environment. If you're working with a newer version of an, a nonlinear editor and you bring in a pure white graphic and it doesn't go above 100 on the, on the scope, then you're okay. This allows you though, like for example, broadcast safe saturation. See these reds and yellows down here? They're too intense for use in a broadcast environment. So I could run this action here, and it's going to automatically detect any areas that are too bright. And what it says is, if the layer mask that's applied is pure white, then you didn't need the action. Well, if I look at the layer mask here, you see it is not pure white. So it did actually do something. And what it did is it applied a saturation adjustment just to the problem areas without width. And we could tweak that as needed, pull things down. See, there it is. Let's set that back up. And what it's done is it's applied a saturation adjustment and limited the adjustment to only the areas that were too bright. Now, why do I do it this way? Some of you may know that there is a filter in Photoshop called NTSC Colors. And you would think that this filter would do a good job. It's been there forever. I wish it did a good job. See, we have something like this, and we fill that with pure red, okay? Red being one of those colors that's not very good in video. Pure red, that is. And if we run this filter video NTSC colors, you see that it knocked that red down, right? Everyone see that? The problem is, let's blur this here. This filter does not have any sort of threshold or tolerance. So take a look at it now when we run it on this blurred object where there's a transition between the red and the white. Everyone see the problem? It just hard clamps down on the problem colors, and there's no transition zone between safe and not safe. But if you use the broadcast safe saturation action, it attempts to isolate that down. See? And it created a blur zone there via the mask and tried to make it a little more gradual. And you can always select that mask if you need to and further blur it so it's a little bit softer, and that allows you to create the saturation adjustment a little bit more gently.